Hello, welcome to Question Time. In answer to the obvious f first question, um, the two Campbells are sitting side by side, but they're not related. Uh, over the next hour, we have question and argument here. The panel don't know the questions that are going to be put to them. Let's have the first question straight away, which comes from Michael Green, who is a consultant agriculturalist. Mr. Green. In view of today's unexpected and unwelcome rise in interest rate, should the Bank of England be allowed to be in total control? Seven point. 5%. It's gone to. Michael Howard? No, I don't think the Bank of England should be in total control. I think that the management of interest rates is a key part of the management of the economy, and it's one of the main things which governments are elected to do. So I think governments ought to accept their responsibility for setting interest rates, and I think it was a great mistake to hand that responsibility over to the Bank of England. Of course, the Chancellor of the Exchequer must bear a great share of the responsibility for the increase in interest rates because so far from doing what he should have done, which is to take action to encourage saving since the election, in fact he's attacked saving, he's attacked pensions, he's attacked PEPs and TESAs, and that has contributed to the fact that people have spent their money and the Bank of England has felt it necessary to raise interest rates. But I think these interest rates have gone too high. I don't think today's interest was justified and I certainly don't think that the responsibility should have been handed over to the bank. And had it not been the bank, you think it might be a bit lower, do you? Well, I, I would certainly hope so. I don't know what decisions uh, the Chancellor of the Exchequer would have made, uh, but I certainly think that interest rates are higher than they need be. Okay, Michael Green, do you agree with that? Yes, I do. Um, my instinctive reaction about the banks being put in control is that they shouldn't be, because I think the last thing they should be put in control of is money. <laughs> okay. But I do agree with the, pra the, the basic thrust of what's, what's just been said. Okay. And I think that we also need to consider the fact that, that this is the Bank of England and they are going to act not only in the interest of the country but in the interest of the banking industry and banks have to make a profit. Harriet Harman? Well, I think it's right that we move to give the Bank of England uh, more independence over the decision about interest rates. I think that the evidence over the past few decades is that interest rates need to be taken in, on economic grounds. They need to be taken because they're important to the economy, not just for the immediate term, but for the longer term. And I think the temptation always has been there for politicians to take a short-term view. And just as, as, as Michael <coughs> Howard has evidenced now, and this is what, certainly what happened with Kenneth Clark in the past, taking a short-term view, ducking the difficult decisions. And if you give the, to be a measure of independence, then those decisions can be taken on eco economic grounds for the longer term. And those economies where they've got uh, more independence in the decision-making about interest rates have been more stable um, and more secure, and there's been more confidence in them. So I think that, it, of course, it's going to be hard for people. People do find it difficult when interest rates go up, but they find it even harder if there's boom and bust and instability in the economy and they n don't just have to pay a bit extra on their mortgage, they actually lose their home because their business goes bust and they lose their job. But what if you think as a, as a government that the bank has got it wrong? Well, I think you can always second guess the decision when you've actually given a, a measure of independence. But I think that if you've given that independence, you have to accept it. And I think that the right decision was made and we should accept it. The man at the back, though. Yes, I think there has to be a proper balance between taxes and interest rates. And if you leave the Treasury looking after taxation and the Bank of England looking after interest rates, you'll get everything out of order. And uh, the considerable damage is being done to the British economy now. Interest rates are going up, sterling's going up, and the whole manufacturing sector is being very savage, very severely savage. So I mean, everything's out of order. And your um, prescription would be what? Well, I mean, I think, as far, I think possibly tax uh, should have been adjusted. I mean, one of the problems at the moment is that house prices are just in the southeast of England are booming, and that's causing the whole economy to get out of order. And, of course, interest rates are subsidi subsidised by tax cuts. I mean, that's one thing that's out of order. Um, but it is very serious, the damage which is being done to the whole of the British manufacturing sector. Okay. Uh, Mingus Campbell. Well, I agree with quite a lot of what's been said in the last moment or two. The difficulty here is that there's a direct relationship between monetary policy, interest rates and fiscal policy, and that's taxation. And the problem is uh, that the Chancellor of the Exchequer has said rightly that the Bank of England should be independent in setting interest rates, but he said that he's not prepared to make any 
serious changes to the present rate of tax. And as a consequence, you've got a boom in the consumer economy, uh, which is causing the economy in general to overheat. But you've got virtually a recession in the manufacturing economy because of the strength of the pound. And indeed, agriculture is suffering particularly because of the consequences that has for the green pound. And if we're going to get this into balance, we've got to be prepared to use both of these weapons, both monetary policy and fiscal policy. What's your prescription going to be? Well, L lower interest rates and higher taxation? Well, I think you will get low, lower interest rates if you uh, ma make it clear that you intend, as soon as is possible, to join the single European currency. One of the reasons why the pound is so high is because there's still uncertainty as to whether or not Britain will join the single European currency. And our interest rates are much higher uh, than those countries which will have already made that declaration. And on tax, no change? On tax, I think you have to uh, judge where you think the uh, balance of advantage lies. But if, like us, you argue there should be greater investment in health and education, uh, and one of the ways you may better be able to do that is by raising more taxes, then here you can, uh, as it were, get two for the price of one. You can help to reduce the value of an overinflated pound, and you can also find the means by which to reduce waiting lists uh, and to provide okay. more teachers in the classroom. The woman in the blue jacket there. Yeah, going back to Ms. Um, Mr. Howard, um, he said that he thinks it's the responsibility of the government to control the currency. Do you think the German government is irresponsible in trusting the Bundesbank? I think that uh, in our system, <laughs> government should be accountable to Parliament for those decisions. I think that is why we elect governments, and I think they should be accountable to Parliament. Uh, and that is one of the reasons why uh, I think decisions should be taken in this country, in the interests of this country, and really there's no link at all uh, between uh, our interest rates, contrary to what Lynn Campbell has said, uh, and, and what's happening in Europe at the moment. The very fact that our interest rates are so much higher than interest rates on the continent of Europe is an indication of how our economy is operating to a different cycle, is not in sync with the, with the economies on the continent of Europe, which is one of the reasons why it would be such a mistake for us to join the single currency. Okay. B. Campbell. I, th I think broadly that it's right that these, these powers and functions are separated. However, in the end, we can't escape from the politics of the problem. And you've alluded to the, the difficulty that the Chancellor has because he's stuck in a kind of straitjacket of his own making, vis-a-vis -vis taxation, vis-a-vis -vis a whole swathe of economic strategies. And we have a massive, enduring, chronic problem in Britain, which is our long-term relationship to investment and the short-termism of, of British economic strategies of both governments, actually, as it happens, and certainly of our financial institutions. So I don't know that the critical thing is the, the separation or not of the Bank of England from the government, but it is about a kind of a tradition in Britain in relation both now to taxation and economic investment. Man in the second row. So members of the panellists are talking as though the bank is wholly independent, whereas the fact is that out of the nine members of the panel, four were appointed by the government. According to the minutes which are published, all four Every single meeting, vote for an increase in interest rates. Surely if the government didn't agree, they could just replace some of those members of the panel. Harriet, how many? Well, that's why I said a, a measure of independence. I mean, obviously, there is the question of appointments. But I think the difficulty with interest rates, if you don't take the hard decisions early enough, because you're looking over your shoulder and hoping things will brighten up, so you don't take what might be in immediate terms a difficult decision, you end up having to put interest rates up much higher later on when things have gone wrong. And that's why we ended up in 1990 with interest rates at 15%. And long-term interest rates are now coming down. And it's precisely because Gordon Brown wants to address the issue of long-term investment and long-term stability that's needed for that long-term investment that he's taken this very bold move of actually divesting himself of some of that, that quick and easy power in the interest of the long term. And I think broadly it's been welcomed. It's not all easy. We've got deep-rooted fundamental economic problems in this country, but I think this is part of the solution. You seem to be saying that if the four government appointed members of the committee take the wrong decisions, you'll replace them. Is that what you were saying? No, not at all. I don't think there's any intention. Well, there's no intention you for this said to be partial independence. Well, I said a measure of independence because do they do your bidding? Is what I mean. No, they're 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 independent, but some of them are appointed. Is is the point that I'm that I'm trying so to make? So they can be, <laughs> so they can be sacked. 
Well, you know, they come up for, for, for reappointment. I don't know what the exact details are, but the point is they do <laughs> act independently, obviously. There's no intention. If Gordon wanted to keep control of interest rates, he wouldn't have actually given it over to the Bank of England. I don't think anybody seriously okay. suggested that this is a smokescreen. <laughs> but it does mean there will be difficult decisions, but they'll be taken at the right time, and in the longer term, it will be better. We can't go back to the situation of boom and bust where... Thousands of businesses uh, went bust. I mean, Michael Howard talks as if we've just moved out of a golden era of the economy. One of the reasons why the Tories lost right. the election. You don't have you don't have long-term investment by savaging British exporters, by doing great damage to British farmers, by clobbering homeowners. An average fifty thousand pounds mortgage holder is going to pay an extra sixty-five pounds a month on their mortgage as a result of the interest changes that have taken place since the election. Doing all those things is not actually going to help long-term investment in this country at all. Okay, we, we, we'll go on to another question because we've, we've taken some time on that. We must move on. Let's go on to the next question from Jane Barnby, who is a secretary. Jane Barnby. Um, I was just wondering, why is Gaza being treated as a modern-day hero or martyr? who takes front page priority over all the other serious events of the week. B. Campbell. <laughs> <laughs> what can you say in answer to such a question? <laughs> However, uh, there has to be an answer. I think what's very interesting about the Gaza phenomenon is that he's at the centre of issues that we're all very interested in. Primarily, actually, how men behave. And... <laughs> <laughs> And of course, the, the tragedy of this man is that he belongs to this extraordinary, powerful, rich business, football. And the very moment when he was revealed, really, as a catastrophic man after he battered his wife, you remember those terrible pictures of this wounded woman, the boss, Hoddle, says, I'll take care of business, I'll sort out this man. And we all... <laughs> <laughs> take your hand. Give us a chance. <laughs> <laughs> and of course that was both grandiose and useless. He hasn't sorted out this man. And what I think is being revealed here is that there's a culture surrounding this poor bloke who's spilling his emotions all over the place, often violently, often drunk, is that his best friends who are laddish and loaded are no use at all. The football manager of England is no use at all, despite his grandiose proclamations. <laughs> Who's to blame for this? Surely, you know, it's clear it's, it's not his mother, who I imagine did her best. So I think <laughs> there's a, a really, there's a serious conversation at stake about football culture and masculinity. Okay. Man on the left-hand side there. Do you agree with this attack on... Well, actually, the I was going to make the point, is that the ability to cry at will and spill one's emotions a very feminine trait? Well, the trouble is that, uh, I mean, I think many men are, are well used to crying. In this instance, you see, it's not just that he cries, it's that he fouls, he has tantrums on and off the field, he beats up the woman that he's supposed to love. I mean, this man is, a very, is in a very serious state. And all of the, the blokes around him haven't been, been any use at all in clarifying what exactly his problem is. Okay. Mingus Campbell, do you agree with that? Well, I mean, what's interesting about this man is he's all of these things, you're quite right. But when he was at his peak, in his pomp, as I think they say in Yorkshire, he was probably the finest footballer in the world. He had a remarkable skill and extraordinary capacity and he had an amazing relationship with the people who came to watch him now 30 years ago we'd never have known any of these things about him except his ability on the football field and i remember my great boyhood hero was dennis compton and on the day of a test match beginning it's worth remembering dennis compton used to turn up sometimes half past 10 in the morning still in his dinner jacket because he hadn't actually been to bed and go out and, and score a hundred uh, and we never knew about any of these things, and all we knew was the achievement, the sporting achievement. And I think what's happened to Gaza is that he has become part of this extraordinary focus on the private lives of people who are in the public eye. But he's also a victim of the fact that sport is now so professional and demands such high standards that the kind of cavalier behavior that people once got away with is no longer appropriate. He nearly did. Hold on a second. He, he, had he been 10% fitter, actually, Hollow would have had him in the team. 
you must be joking. They, well, no, no, they were desperate joking. to have him in the team. Well, but you see, he's, yes, he's, but you see, he's unfit, restless, and actually not managing his life very well. well. Never mind his football. But you see, I think there'll be millions of supporters out there who rather wish he was in the team. And the first time England don't win, people will say it's all Glenn Hoddle's fault because he didn't pick Gaza, who has this amazing talent. Okay. And um, Harriet Harman, they'll say the Minister of Sport said it was the right decision, so they'll blame the government as well. All right, well, I'm glad you're drawing on my football expertise here tonight. Um, I mean, I think the reason why we, you know, it's, it's commanded the front pages is it's a kind of great, huge, kind of tragic uh, comedy and drama. He had obviously huge talent, and we all saw the clips on the TV where he would start almost at the other side's goal and go all the way through and score a goal and all the magic that went with that. So he had a huge talent, but he just blew it. He obviously couldn't handle it. And I've got in my mind those images of him going from one end of the pitch to the other and scoring a goal. But on the other hand, the front page of the tabloids with Cheryl with her black eye and her arm in a sling. So I kind of am looking to the people who are in the team, who are in the squad. I think it must be really hard for them that they want everybody to get behind them when they go out and hopefully beat Tunisia. And everybody's concentrating on the guy who isn't in the team. So I think, you know, Gaza had his chance. He blew it. We should get on with getting behind the team to uh, but, beat But Tunisia. you understand it being front page news, taking priority over other things? Uh, up until today, and then I think we should forget about it. <laughs> okay. The, the questioner. Could I, yes. I just think you used the word tragic, you know. I mean, a tragedy is a train crash, but tragedy doesn't apply to a footballer, you know. I mean, he's not gentleman. I, I know this sounds like a trivial question. Uh, he's not a good example to the kids. I mean, not of the ilk of footballers of the past. And Dennis Compton, I just think I've, I've not a lot of sympathy with him all round, and I just don't see why all the fuss is being made about him. Okay. The ma man in the, in the, yeah, in the second row. I think to call him a victim is completely incorrect, and I'm glad that he's not on the team. He's not a good example, and he shouldn't be held up as such. Okay. And the man in the blue and white shirt there, the second row from the back. <coughs> yes, you. I think to generalise and say that... Um, it's a cultural thing that footballers and young men alike will just go out and get drunk. Is um, or a, it's partly true, of course. <laughs> but, uh, but I don't, I don't think that. I don't think the lady. I'm sorry, I can't remember your name. B. Campbell. Uh, I, I don't think you should generalise and say that people like Gascoigne are an obvious product of of masculinity in, in British culture, because there are 22 other players out in La Manga or wherever they are at the moment who aren't going out and getting drunk and whatever every night. And I think that you know that you should have a lot of respect for people who come from that sort of background. Who really okay. Makes sense. And, and the woman in, in scarlet, on the left there. I do think it's it's telling that Hoddle didn't sack Gaza for beating his wife, but he has sacked him for drinking and smoking. Yeah. Michael Howard. <laughs> well, I think I disagree with the lady who said um, it wasn't a tragedy. It is a tragedy. It's a human tragedy, because he had a great talent and he's squandered it. He had a great talent and he gave great pleasure to millions of people who really enjoyed the kind of things he could do on the pitch. And the fact that he has squandered that talent is a real human tragedy. Now, um, I think Glenn Hoddle was absolutely right not to include him in the squad, but then I'm a Liverpool supporter and I want Steve McManaman to be in the team. And I hope that Glenn will choose Steve McManaman. But I think that the story of Gaza is a real human tragedy, and that's why it's been on the front page. And what about the specific point that the woman made uh, about him beating up his wife, and that should have had him sat from the team rather than drunkenness and... I think there's a lot of points in that. Do you? Well, because by his behaviour, he brought the game of football into the subject. So they should have done it, it long ago. It's course. a noble game. It's a game that hundreds, thousands, perhaps millions of people take part in every weekend in Britain, either by spectating or by playing themselves. And I think it brings the game into disrepute when someone who's behaved in that way is allowed to represent his country. Let's take a vote on this. We must go on. Let's just take a vote. Do you think that uh, Glenn Hoddle was right to drop Gaza? Well, a very heavy vote in favour of Hoddle's decision. 78% yes, 17% no, 5% of you undecided. Let's go on to another question. This is from David Bache, or Batch? Bache. Bache, good. A photographer. Um, given the recent announcement by the government of the very significant investment to uh, help the Channel Tunnel rail link, is it perhaps not time to, to reconsider uh, renationalizing the railways? The government is spending 5.8 billion in this new um, rail track, or un supporting it with 5.8 billion, some of it 
not necessarily to be spent. Harriet Harman, why not renationalise? They're done with it. What's the reason why we've been able to get this back on track and it, uh, having the deal fallen apart, it's now, it's now set to, to go forward again, which is incredibly important, is because we've got a partnership between the public and the private sector. So we've got considerable public investment, which I think is justified by the importance of the rail link for our, our economy and for passengers and, and for the environment and to get us up to speed with the rest of Europe. But I think that it's right that we should have private investment where we can lever that in as well. And there's extra investment from London Continental Railways, extra investment for rail tracks. So if the public sector can be a partner and direct it and it can be in the public interest but not bear all the responsibility for raising the finance, it seems to me that the public and the taxpayer get the best deal. What do you think? I've recently had to do quite a lot of travel by train all over the country. Um, and I have to say that as compared with the old days of British Rail, organising the trips was immensely mm. more complex. Um, it was very difficult to work out fares, and I certainly didn't feel always confident I was getting necessarily the cheapest fare or the best fare. Um, and I entirely agree. I think you know, one, one hopes that there is private and public investment, but it seems to be have got into a rather parlour state that it needed the government to step in for something that is actually very important to the country. But, uh, but, but uh, Harriet Harman, the, um, I said 5.8 billion, which is the kind of package the taxpayer could have to foot for a little bit of rail track that in cuts 20 minutes off a journey. And I'm told that rail track was actually sold for about under half that, 2 billion, and is now only worth 4 billion. So you could have used the 5.8 and bought the whole thing back into public ownership. Well, I think it, it has been a bit of a, a shambles the way it's gone along, and certainly the privatisation of the railways and the letting out of all those franchises, you know, which are going to last for many years, have subsequently been shown, as we said at the time, to be a poor deal for the taxpayer. But those are decisions that have been taken, and we've got to move forward from here. But I do think that it's in principle right that we should have public control and accountability and public investment but also look for the opportunities for private investment. And I share your view. I'm mean, trying to ring up and get the rail timetable about how you get from A to B. I mean, you ring up twice, you get two different answers. Okay. Now, B. Campbell, what do you think? Renationalise? If you can get through, that is. <laughs> it's almost beyond the, the core of your question. It's almost like we've moved past the point where anybody is going to do that thing and yet I imagine that there are many people in this room and I'm with you would feel in their heart of hearts my goodness what what have we got a what have we done this privatization was probably the most unpopular it's absolutely disastrous um, it's a kind of mad system and and railway travelers have a kind of secret life actually we share very elaborate jokes and complaints about the dottiest of things that you have to do in order to get on a train and get you know to point B However, there's clearly no political champions, apart from travellers at the moment, for renationalisation of the railways. So I think that your, your question speaks to something, you know, very deep in the national mood, but is, which is not endorsed at the level of parliamentary politics. The woman with the, with the red, red rose, or pink rose. Yes, well, I've travelled by train lately and it's proved an utter disaster. You have to book through, you have to find out the timetables through one phone one phone call then book for another phone call and then when you arrive they charge you an absolutely different amount but do you, you know? want a renationalization i think so yes because it just doesn't work there's less people working on the railways it is less safe to travel we've had murders we've had all sorts and by employing more people that would give more tax and it's just utter chaos okay. it's I, I regret it i absolutely cannot forgive the Tory government for doing it. Okay. And the man, the man at the very back there, yes. Let's not forget, Mr Howard, it was your government that introduced it and rushed it. Mm -hmm. And your government is responsible for the chaos that is now in the railways. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, it's certainly true that we, uh, we, privatized, we privatized the railways, we privatized British Airways, we privatized British Telecom, and very few people would now argue that British Airways should be renationalized. 
or the British Airports Authority should be renationalised. Yeah, I'm talking about Or the them. British Telecom exactly. should be renationalised. Yeah, I'm the talking point, about them. That's right. <laughs> and the point, and the point is, the point is that you have really? to give, you have to give the privatised railways, as you had to give all those other privatisations, time in order to allow them to gain the improvements and put into effect the improvements which all those other industries which were privatised have done. That is why privatisation is being put into effect all over the world. We led the world in this, and the rest of the world is following, and it's working here and everywhere else. One word on the Channel Tunnel Railway. It's uh, not quite right, I'm sure, I didn't really want to give this impression, but it's not quite right to suggest that public-private sector partnerships were invented by this government. The private finance initiative was one of the most inventive ideas of the last government. It was a public-private partnership, and we saw a role for public-private partnerships as well as for privatisation. Actually, public-private partnerships were invented by John Prescott, who advocated it when no, we were in opposition, no, no, no. and you, it was an idea that you picked up. No. Okay. The, the woman on the left. Yes, you, on the side. Um, the, the amount of money that's spent on this Channel Tunnel, which um, Harriet deems as, as, a, as a disaster, and I sort of agree with, um, you're spending taxpayers' money here, and something else that's being spent huge, vast amounts of money on is the Millennium Dome. Do you agree that it's been wisely spent when um, it could be spent on the homeless or on, you know, single mothers and things like that? Ming Campbell. Well, uh, I have considerable reservations about the Millennium Dome. I actually happen to think myself that it would be much better to have had a series of projects throughout the whole country so that the whole of the country could have profited uh, and had some benefit from the commemoration of what is uh, uh, a remarkable occasion. And the railway? But on the railway... Mrs. Thatcher decided that the link had to be paid for by private money. President Mitterrand decided it should be done with public money. And so when you get through the tunnel uh, and you go from the end of the tunnel in France to Paris, uh, you go on a high-speed link at high speed in great comfort. It was public money that provided that in France. Here we decided to take an alternative route, and that route has proved to be unsuccessful. Now the question really asked us, uh, can we go back? I'm afraid to say I don't think we can. And my real anxiety about John Prescott's proposal, which financially is actually rather a clever proposal, is that it only provides for the high-speed link to go from the end of the tunnel to a place called Ebbsfleet. Which well, everybody wants to go to Ebbsfleet. Well, <laughs> Ebbsfleet doesn't actually appear on very many maps, I understand. <laughs> it's a place in uh, railway law and nowhere else. And my anxiety as someone who lives... Uh, most of the time in Scotland, and represents the Scottish constituency, is that unless we get the link between Ebbsfleet uh, and St Pancras, then the opportunity for people who live in Scotland to make a direct trip using the rail network through into Europe will be, well, it won't be diminished, it will be lost entirely. So this investment will only realise its proper value if it's accompanied by the necessary investment in the rest of the network. OK, let's hear some more views from the audience. Yes, you, sir. Uh, Mark Curry, a uh, computing student. Um, going back a slight bit, when was the last time any of the panel had to rely on uh, British Rail and were you satisfied by the service you got? Uh, last Friday and I was. <laughs> British Rail? Yeah. British Rail? Well, I travel uh, <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> on the railway. The woman, the woman in the third row. Yeah. Yeah. After the terrible accident in Germany yesterday, do we really need a high-speed link if it's only going to save 20 minutes on the journey. Another half left? What do you think? Well, I think well, you have well, to we, wait. We need to find out why that dreadful tragic accident occurred, and, and the Germans will have an well, inquiry and, and, and will tell us. You think the speed the is crashing, just wrong? Crashing at, at that one yesterday, 125 miles an hour, and this high-speed link is going to be 180. But there Can are we? high-speed trains all across the world, and we need to find yes, out why bigger, that accident bigger occurred. bigger countries with more space. I'll take one more point from man over there on there. As a train driver, I uh, personally think that uh, privatisation is nonsense. And also, why don't we fix up what we got with the money being spent on a 20-minute savings rather than spending money on brand new things? Why don't we fix up what we got and make it better for everybody, just not just a few people going to Paris every day? Well, may In, in, so in reply to the question, is the Channel Tunnel 
rail link worth the expense, your expense, would you like to say whether it is or it isn't? View of that applause, and we'll see whether it represents what you, what you all think. Is it worth the expense? 28% yes, 65% no, 7% undecided. Next question is from Barnaby Perkins, who's a student. Hello. Uh, can a shadow cabinet containing both Anne Widdicombe and Michael Howard... <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> ..provide an effective parliamentary opposition? Um, I don't know who to put this one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, difficult task. Well, difficult task. Well, you. difficult. Yes. well um, I suppose she could be said to have scuppered your chances of being Tory leader by saying you had something of the night about you. <laughs> How do you sit with her in shadow cabinet? I think she's been extremely effective in opposition. She has been a very effective critic of the government. I've said this before. I think she's absolutely earned her place in the shadow cabinet and I have no difficulty in working with her at all. Have you forgiven her for what she said about you? Uh, that was in the past. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely in the past. But have you forgiven her? Well, I didn't. I, <laughs> I don't think forgiveness enters into it. That was absolutely in the past. Uh, forgiveness doesn't enter. I, I think she's doing an extremely effective job, you've and that. I want her to do that job in the shadow yes. cabinet. But you haven't forgiven her. No. <laughs> People are, in, people are entitled to have differences of opinion, you know. Forgiveness doesn't really enter into it. I'm not going to ask you 14 times. <laughs> Harriet Harman. I think that whoever the individual personalities are in the shadow cabinet set to oppose the government in the House of Commons, the biggest problem is that people remember their record. And therefore, when Anne Widdicombe speaks about the health service or the person who speaks about education talks about education, People, people will remember why they voted the Tories out um, and therefore it matters less to some extent who, who the individuals are. But I think that the other thing that blunts their, their opposition is that they don't seem to have yet understood why they were rejected. I think that Peter Lilly was on the radio the other day. He's been put in charge of thinking the way forward for the Conservative Party. And when he was asked why the voters rejected the Tory party, apparently he was completely speechless. But the new people in the shadow cabinet seem to be a move to the right. So what they haven't learnt is that they became out of touch with the centre ground of people in Britain and they seem to have responded by moving even further to the right. So I don't think that Frank Dodson has got much to fear from Anne Widdicombe. I would say that Michael Howard has much more to fear from her. <laughs> he, um, he might, of course, just be speechless, the way you describe yourself being speechless on occasion when you don't know what the answer is. And, and giving the impression of being an airhead, but taking it on your shoulders as a sort of price you pay for being a politician. Perhaps yeah, people are doing the same. Complete misquote, David. <laughs> Pretty accurate, but anyway. <laughs> I have it below the table if you want me to, but I won't bother. Mingus Campbell. Uh, well, Michael Howard may or may not have forgiven her, but he certainly hasn't forgotten her. Uh, and I think the answer to the question is only time will tell but I suspect it's going to provide a great deal of amusement uh, for the rest of us uh, as we look to see this uh, team building. They're all, going off on the they're all going off on the 15th of September in their sweaters again to a seaside resort uh, to engage in some bonding. So I'd be very interested to see how Michael Hard and Anne Widdicombe bond. But what I thought was really interesting is that Stephen Dorrell, uh, who represents a particular strand of opinion in the Conservative Party, decided that he no longer wanted to be considered for the front bench, and he went off in that classic phrase to spend rather more time with his family. But no sooner had he done so than he immediately, immediately launched an attack on the attitude of William Hague towards Europe. And I think that's really what tells you a great deal about the Conservative Party front bench or no front bench, namely that the issue of Europe is as deeply divisive in the Conservative Party now as it was before and during the general election. And until that issue is resolved, then their capacity to be an effective opposition is going to be severely damaged. Okay. The man in the second row here. Is, is it not the case that people will remember Harriet Harman's record when she gets shuffled sideways in a couple of weeks' time <laughs> for bashing single mothers and uh, disabled people? Harriet Harman. <laughs> Answer it. Well, I think that... If I look at what... We've been in, in government for, for a year now, and I've been in Social Security for a year, and I think that what difference it's made to my constituents. I think that the difference will be those 
those mothers who previously were trapped on benefit, bringing up their kids on benefit, who've now got the opportunity to work and be better off in work than they could ever be on benefit. And They've got less well, money out of you. Those mothers who go into work, and many are now with our tiny support. Proportion. No, it's not a tiny proportion. Are better off, on average, by £38 a week, which is more than they could have ever been given in a benefit increase. And I think of the nursery places and the after-school clubs that we're going to be setting up. And I think going of the, the extra... Well, the investment has been put aside. And I think of the, the extra investment, the help with pensioners with their winter fuel bills. And I think that we've made a substantial start on turning things around, getting people back to do work. You, do you regret the way round that this went, with the, um, the, 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 uh, the mothers, unmarried mothers, losing the benefit being announced first? and being forced to announce that or deciding to announce that before the other changes? I mean, of course, the, the controversy and the row was regrettable, but I think that the principle of recognising that lone parents have extra costs, particularly in the form of childcare, and therefore helping them by backing them up with mm. childcare, but otherwise looking at not whether it's a, a married couple or a lone parent, but looking at what the income is in that family and the age of the children and making sure that's how you decide the benefits. I think the principle on that was right, and I also think it was right then in the subsequent budget to make sure there was help for all families and children. But is it the kind, of row, is it the kind of row that can, can scupper you? You say it was unfortunate. Well, I think people have to look at our, our record overall. Your record. I think people have to look at, well, uh, people have to look at my record overall, and I no. think I'm proud of what I've done in terms of extending opportunities for people to work and getting extra help to pensioners. Okay. I well, think that's what's no, important. Hold on, no, but, but, but B, B. Campbell hasn't had a chance to get in with this. It's a terrible shame, I think, Harriet, to be absolutely honest. It's a terrible shame that the thing that you will be remembered for is that disastrous decision to defend cuts in benefit of any kind for single mothers. It just was disastrous. And I'm terribly sorry for you that that you were involved in that row, actually. It's a, it's a really, it's a damn shame. And I hope, and indeed I'm sure, that New Labour learnt a lot from that disastrous row because it discovered something about what Britain is really like. It didn't want you to do that. And that's, so it's great that you're doing all these other things. That's terrific. However, that was a, a, a very disappointing discovery for you to have to make. But you did discover that, that those kinds of measures don't have a mass endorsement actually in this country so that was a very important lesson but can we go back to the <laughs> <laughs> i want to say something about harry the the question. Question. Yes. one of the things that i think is is lovely about the shadow cabinet is that you've got you've got your good self <laughs> and you've got <laughs> doris carloff as she likes to be called and it seems to me that you are very alike Really. So there's every reason why they should get on, because they're both bruisers. They're both, in, a lot, in lots of ways, alien beings from a dying planet, I'd say. <laughs> so from the point of view of the artistic, great. So you, you have no difficulty imagining them bonding, bonding, bonding well, no, well together. Right. Right. Now, Harriet was talking about her record, and one of the things that is a prominent part of her record is that before the election, she was asked the specific question as to whether she would put through legislation implementing those cuts in benefit. And she said, of course not. And in direct contradiction of that promise, that, of course, is exactly what she did in government. And it's one of many promises that this government has already broken in the short time that it's been in office. Mm -hmm. well, I'm middle-aged, middle-class, and grey-haired. I'm supposed to be the kind of person of whom there are far too many in the House of Commons who yep. don't really understand the problems of single parents bringing up families. But on that particular occasion, I find myself in the lobby doing my best to defend the interests of single parents, and in particular, the interests of single mothers. And what I thought was regrettable was that so many of the 104 or 105 new Labour women MPs were not willing to come and join us to defend that principle. Okay, and one more point, the woman in the third row, please. Yes. Um, yes, going back to Harriet Harman and her cuts on single benefit for single mothers, um, if people could go out, if women could go out and get a decent job that would pay them a decent wage after they've paid for their childcare, they would be happy to do that. Now, you just said that 
a woman going into work now on your programmes is, um, is going to be earning an extra £38 a week. £38 a week is not a lot of money. That's a drop in the ocean. I think if you ask women, and what they will say is for £38 a week, they would rather stay home with their children and bring their children up in a loving environment. £38 a week is not going to stimulate women to want to go into work. Okay. I, I, well, very briefly, Harriet, okay. we want to move on. The fact of the matter is that, that lone mothers have been moving off income support and going into work, and many more of them want to do that, and they haven't had any support from the government. And £38 a week is a lot more than they would get on income support. And we're helping with childcare. And many lone parents in my constituency have been saying to me over the years, both the ones that work and have been able to work, and the ones that can't work but that would like to but haven't got a nursery place, that they want to work because they want a better standard of living for themselves and their children, but also because they want to work because they don't want to bring their children up in a household where no one is working, where the children never see the world of work and expect that life for them will be a life on benefits. And once their youngest child has started school, married mothers go out to work, but lone mothers have been trapped on the benefits system. And I know that we'll look back at a situation where we assumed that it was good enough for lone mothers to be year in, year out, living a life of dependence on benefit, even once their children have started school, and we'd say it's unbelievable that we didn't recognise their aspirations to work, their, their need for a better standard of living, and their desire to set a better example to their children okay. than years of dependence Thank on you. benefits. Let's take another question from Christine Olanian, who's an office manager. Are pictures of starving children detrimental to Africa's long-term development prospects? The context of this is Claire Short, isn't it, uh, saying this week that one of the reasons that people were despondent and in despair about the third world was all the adverts of constant famine, failure and dreadful pictures. And also saying that in the case of Sudan, for instance, there was no need for money to be raised publicly. The money was there from government. Um, Mingus Campbell, what did you make of well, that, I, I read that, and I also heard her explain her position in the House of Commons mm. uh, earlier this week. And I think she's right when she says, in relation to the Sudan, which was the particular example, then the problem is not a lack of money. The problem is that the two warring factions in the country have set out to try and use the aid which is available as a political weapon in their battle against each other. And if there had been freedom of access, freedom of passage, then there is more than enough food, and there are more than enough resources to make sure that the people of the Sudan do not starve but what about and do not appear in yeah. those terrible pictures. But what to about which the point referred? that the pictures themselves, which you seem to be saying, the actual images that are shown are detrimental, put people off, they feel nothing can be done? Do you well, agree with I that? don't agree with that because if you remember uh, Bob Geldof's extraordinary success uh, when he managed to motivate the people of Great Britain in a way perhaps that politicians would envy, but perhaps. Uh, have rarely achieved to recognize the need to provide support for the poorest people in the world. I think there is an almost uh, un un unfathomable uh, willingness on the part of people in this country to be generous and to try and alleviate the suffering of those who are the poorest in the world. So I don't necessarily agree with uh, that analysis that Claire Short gave. Okay. I think unless you see these pictures, uh, then you're inclined to take these matters for granted. It does not bring home to you in the kind of immediacy which spurs you into making a contribution the extent of the problem. B. Campbell, do you think that we've got inured to a cliché picture of famine and have the wrong impression, therefore, of what is going on in the third world? Yes and no. I think she was trying to say something subtle about the picture of Africa that is offered in <coughs> those pictures. Um, and the, the now long serial of very familiar images, devastating images, of how we've left that continent. I think she was trying to say something about uh, partly the, uh, something which I think is undoubtedly true, a kind of despairing averting of our eyes. That, I think it, that it happens. I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen in my own household. However, I think what you say is also true, that people... Uh, if people are empowered and enabled and understand what's going on, do dip in and do make a massive contribution to people who are 
facing the most terrible adversity. Actually, Ireland, um, interestingly, is a, is a much more significant giver than Britain is. And interestingly, of course, Ireland is very connected to a famine-stricken Africa, partly because of its own collective memory of famine. These things are not just acts of God. They know very well. Um, and also because Ireland, people from Ireland are all over the world as people involved in missionary work and rescue work. Okay. However, she's trying to make a subtle point, I think, about do we always only need to see failure in connection to famine? Is that the story that we're really being told about Africa? Is that right? And I think she's right to question right. that. The one in the dead middle there, in the black. Um, I actually don't agree with Claire Shaw. I think... Um, one of the only times that the media get it right is when it comes down to charity and bring the tension and things like that. And wasn't it something like two people um, gave about £2 million in the past week? Mm -hmm. And I think the media is great when it comes to things like that, bring the tension to really bad causes. What do you think, the, the question is I think Claire Shaw is, is right in what she says, in that we need, Africa needs more of a perspective rather than just these negative images. It's not just poverty, it's not just famine. We need to move on from that. Africa needs investment, it needs commitment for long-term development rather than just short-term famine, poverty and destitution. We need to move on from that position. Okay, and the woman in the fourth row here. Yes. Yes, um, yes. I mean, I'd, I would like to agree what the woman um, just, just this minute said. Um, if we only ever see pictures of uh, starving children, and we respond to that. We're not actually looking at the causes and why those children are starving. I mean, what we should be doing is doing things to prevent those children from starving in the first place and looking at things like investment, exploitation by multinational countries, our own responsibilities about our relationship. Um, I mean, for instance, the fact that they use good farming land or, or land that should be producing food in Kenya to produce expensive vegetables for us to buy in Sainsbury's. But these two things are not inconsistent. You can, no, uh, you can you take part in that kind of long-term investment that you describe yeah, and at the same time still be motivated to respond charity, when there's an emergency. That, 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 that forces a kind of relationship. It's like if you're giving money to a beggar in the street every day, okay, that makes you feel good, but shouldn't you want to know why he's begging yeah. Yes, and what we can do to make it, um, you know, make him in a sit or her in a situation where they don't have to beg. People shouldn't have to beg for but, charity. But while you're working out why he's begging, he's still hungry and you have to feed him. Okay. Yeah, man, but man we're in not blue working blue. that out. In the, man the, uh, the charity money, comic relief, um, whatever it may be, children in need. Um, do you think that, does the panel think that this is more of a short term solution and we should concentrate not only in like, developing trade and industry? But a lot of, a lot of the, these African countries are one-product economies. They rely solely on, for example, Zambia with copper. Um, is it not time to look at investment in these countries and the look, looking at the paying off of aid? At the moment, most of these countries are struggling to pay off the interest mm. on these loans that they've yeah. got. Yeah. There are plans. There have been Jubilee 2000, yeah. for example, which was discussed briefly at the G8 conference. There are plans to try and get rid of this debt completely. But shouldn't, we, shouldn't the governments concentrate okay. on sorting out their debt? Michael Harris. Well, I don't think any of these things are inconsistent with each other. Um, we should certainly do what we can to, to write off debt. And the last government actually took international initiatives to do this and wrote off a billion pounds worth of debt to the poorest countries in the world, more than any other country. And we do need, as the, as the last speaker rightly said, to encourage trade and investment because that is the way in which we are likely to encourage lasting improvements in the economic conditions of people who live in those countries. But that doesn't mean that there's no room for private charity. And while Claire Short might have been right about the problems in the Sudan and the causes of those problems, Difficulty is that what she said might give the impression that there really was no place for charity in helping these countries. The impression that only governments can do it, leave it all to governments. But there is a role for private charity and there is a, is a role for the non-governmental organisations that do such tremendous work in alleviating famine and misery and poverty in these countries. What she actually said was that the Disasters Emergency Committee appeal on Southern Sudan was an unnecessary appeal. Do you think she was wise to say that, Harriet Harman? 
Well, she was talking about Sudan, and she, it's not true to say, as Michael Howard said, that she doesn't see a role for, for charitable donations and for short-term aid. She works... Well, I don't think she did give that impression, and I don't think she said it. I think you've given that impression, but it's, n it's not the truth. She works closely with the aid agencies and believes passionately in the important use of, of, of short-term aid where it's needed. But she's trying to put on the agenda, and I think she's absolutely right, that there's also a need for the search and the economic and political pressure to, to bring about peace and stability. And there's an important role for long-term aid which concentrates on development. And it, you shouldn't pose one against the other. And she's not trying to do that. She's trying to uh, show the importance of that other side of the agenda. It's not just, not just the immediate poverty, but the potential that, that needs to be unlocked there and liberated. And I think the point that was made about debt is absolutely right. And she has put that on the agenda. And whatever was done under the previous government and through governments of the world, mm -hmm. it was not enough. And there is still countries that are paying more in debt to rich countries than they're paying to feed their own people. And I think she's done the debate a service. I want to go on to another question. Zoe Maguire, who's a housewife and mother. Zoe Maguire. Yes. Instead of constant carping about the excessive profits, should we not congratulate Camelot on a job well done? Camelot made a profit of uh, 80 million, an increase of 14%, just announced this week. Should we congratulate them? Do you congratulate them, Harriet Harman? Very briefly. Well, I don't congratulate... Yes or no, I think, really. <laughs> oh, well, then... And then no, and particularly I wouldn't congratulate themselves on giving themselves huge pay rises at public expense. Do you, can, do, you can, do you can congratulate them, Michael Howard? Well, I think that the, the reaction that we've seen from Harriet and from many other people in the government to all this is that in the eyes of many people in the present government, profit is still a dirty word. The important test should be, are they raising the biggest amount of money available for good causes? And all the evidence is that that is actually what Camelot have done. So you congratulate and them. And that, that is the important test which we should apply. Congratulations. Uh, I'd, I'd, sooner con I'd sooner congratulate than criticise. Sooner, sooner congratulate, congratulate than criticise. But you won't come down I one did, side or the other. You see, once you start making... Now, this is the whole point. Because once you start asking people in relation to particular profit levels of particular companies, now, do you approve of that or do you not approve of that? Do you congratulate them or do you criticise? You're missing the point. The point is that if the results are good for society as a whole, there is nothing wrong in making profits, and there is no reason for people to pontificate about them one way or the other. Harriet Hamm, just one thing. Would you like to see their licence taken away from them? Well, I think there's, there's, there's a lot of worries. And the other thing is that they're not just any old company. The point is that there's, they're not just any company like any other. The, the point is that all the money comes from the public, and it's supposed to... More of it should be going to good causes, to, to, to help the arts and theatre and music and <coughs> education and health and other things. And it's, it's not right that they've got a complete monopoly. And th the issue is it's not as if they've, they've won out in competition. They've got it's a the license point. to print money, but they're taking too much of the money that they've got so a license to but print. But you're, you're in government. What's your plan? Well, Chris Smith is keeping a close eye on them. You can be sure <laughs> of that. Well, I don't know what effect that has. Um, the man in the fourth row here. <laughs> If they're doing so well, why do we keep hearing that the good causes are getting less and less to spend? I'm thinking in particular of one where I've, I'm involved with an application to the National Heritage Lottery Fund, and we hear that they're getting less money mm -hmm. to spend. Well, they actually, statistically, they're getting more, even if you're not they getting, are getting more. They are getting more. <laughs> Ming Campbell. Well, you have to congratulate Camelot, but given the remit that they got, they have made maximum use and taken maximum advantage of their remit but you have to condemn the previous government for setting it up on a profit-making basis. It should have been set up on a non-profit-making basis. It is correct that rather than some Camelot director's new Mercedes, the money should be going to some far more worthwhile causes that deserve it more than someone who has an exclusive monopoly to print money. Anyone want to come to the defence of Camelot? Man in the blue shirt. There. Yeah, I would. Isn't part of the problem that in this country there is the politics of envy of people who are doing well, whereas if you look at somewhere like America and they see people doing well, they applaud it. You be see, Campbell, you be, be Campbell. But no, I think... 
what people are aggrieved about here is that this is what Ted Heath would have perhaps called uh, the unacceptable face of capitalism. Actually, they don't like the level of profit. They're actually not doing a job well done. They don't have to do a lot. We all do the doing. We are the ones who are paying in. Very briefly, Harriet Armand said they didn't win it in competition. They did actually win it in competition. And they persuaded everyone that if you, if you looked at how much money they could raise for good causes, they would be likely to raise more money for good causes than non-profit making organizations. And if the test is the amount of money they raise for good causes, that is what we should concentrate on, and that is what we should indeed uh, accept as a fulfillment of the task they were Including given Including attempted do. bribery uh, during the course of getting no, the no, I don't know. Yeah, I don't think it's that. Yeah. The woman in the, in the front row here on the left. Yes, you know. uh, The gentleman just re uh, referred to the politics of envy. Envy is caused, not so much when you see somebody doing better than yourself, I think, I think it's caused because you think you're not doing well. If we were all doing reasonably okay, I don't think we would have the politics of envy. And, um, for instance, the minimum wage. If the minimum wage was set, was set at a much higher level, for instance, I don't think we have a posi a, the, the politics of envy. If there was a minimum wage and a maximum wage, then, you know. Okay. I'm going to try and fit in one last question from Bruce Ingram, who's a stockbroker, and we have about a minute left, or two minutes left, so will everybody have to be Does very Does the brief? panel agree with the Labour member for Thurrock that fawning, obsequious, softball, well-rehearsed, planted questions should have no place in Prime Minister's question time? This was a... a, <laughs> a, brave, a brave Labour MP who asked, this, who asked this question of the Prime Minister yesterday. Ming Campbell. Yes. Um, and, and do you think they do have a place at the moment? Oh, there's far too... Well, what's very interesting is the next question that was asked was a fawning, obsequious, <laughs> softball question. Yes. Uh, um, I think this particular member for Thurrock, who's a man of great independence, I hope he goes down in history. I hope a fawning, obsequious question will now be called in history a McKinley, <laughs> so people <laughs> will know who is responsible yes. for pointing to right. it. Of course, what Mr McKinley said, Michael Howard, was that they used to groan at the fawning, obsequious, softball, well-rehearsed, <laughs> planted questions asked by Conservative members of Mr Major. Well, it was never on uh, this scale, I can <laughs> promise you. And the interesting thing... Well, about no one you, ever fawned on no, you. The interesting, <laughs> the interesting thing that, happened, that, that, that happened yesterday <laughs> was that when the next obsequious question was asked, as Ming rightly says it was the very next question, even the people on the Labour benches looked embarrassed. Yes. <laughs> um, Harriet Harman, are you embarrassed by the kind of questions that get asked? Not Except by the me member for Thurrock, of course. <laughs> not at all. Well, if in outside, when people are engaged, not in the House of Commons, but outside, when people are engaged in a joint endeavour to work as a team, they don't think it helps to be slagging each other off and to be attacking each other on their own side. <laughs> there is debate. But what there shouldn't be, and this is what has been the change from the old Labour Party to the new Labour Party, is that we're trying to work as a team to deliver for the people in Britain. But maybe you should just sit on your hands and not... Rather than just all attack each other, which is why we spent so long in opposition. So we're working oh. as a team, and a lot of people think it's disappointed, right. disappointing, and there are a lot of women yeah. in there now who don't engage in the Yabu politics, and a lot of the press are very disappointed. <laughs> they do. The I'm sorry. I <laughs> what about the no, no, no. to scrutinise the government? Be careful. Very, very very briefly, because I didn't bring you in, but I must bring you in fast. I think the answer is yes, and I think probably get rid of Prime Minister's question time as well, if that's going to be okay. the, you know, the theatre of, that produces all this choreography. Okay, well there are no fawning of secret softball, well-rehearsed or planted questions on <laughs> question time. Yeah. It does bring